We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. When the world was at war, more than 16 million Americans answered the call to serve. These young guys haven't seen much yet, but in a few weeks they'll see a whole lot more than maybe they want to. What they found there, they'll never forget. That's guys out there living through hell. You who have not seen it do not know what hell looks like from the top. The look on their faces, seeing the Nazi swastika and so on. Wow, Dad, this is real? Are you kidding me? These aren't just stories, this is the real deal, you know? All too often, military histories are told from a limited point of view. They follow major figures like Patton or Hitler or Nimitz. His electrifying dash through France and the invasion of Europe will live as long as courage is honored as a human virtue. But every box that we get tells a story. Life is precious, life is short, soldiers die. So they want to express themselves. Letters from home. Each day, millions of them are sent to American servicemen fighting on distant battlefronts. They fold these up and they put them in their helmet to read again, to find the goodness that he can't seem to find here. This is all going to be over and I'm going to be home. Yours for eternity. And the next thing was a telegram. I regret to inform you. The beauty of these lives stands out because of the tragedy that was going to unfold in their lives. World War II veterans are passing away by the hundreds every day, and their personal histories are oftentimes lost at the bottom of a box. That's why my father and I are on a mission. I've been looking at estate sales, online auctions, auction houses, junk shops, finding memorabilia. Toss the box on the table, open it up and we go through the discovery together. Oh my gosh, lots of stuff. Everybody has something like this from parents or grandparents or the like. Every one of those boxes holds a story. I wanna open the box and release the story and it's a celebration. Matt and I know how to go in and mine those things. Every little detail has something to tell us about the story. I'm pretty sure that's Joe Barris. That's the guy we're looking for. Matt's an expert in the military, tracks down that story. He understands and knows that all because he's a veteran. He's been there, done that. Most of my clues point to Joe being in the 42nd. I'm an expert in research. I go finding the family. We do a lot of skip tracing, and skip tracing is used to find people. What's your next step? I don't know. I need to talk to the guy or one of these guys, and they can tell me what actually happened, but they'd be 90 years old now. I do know that there are family members alive in Utica. I don't know what's up with the church, whether they're busy, whether they're slow, whether they're even around, but I know that my trail stops right there. I've exhausted all my options, and if that's all we've got left, let's go to Utica. We're on our way to Utica. The phone rings, I pick it up, and it is Deacon Bill. Yeah, hey, listen, Bill, so we're trying to track the family down. He thought Joe might no longer be with us. They said he was just here two or three days ago, and he's very much alive. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Matt, Joe, Joe was just in the service last week. Really? <laughs> oh, wow. Seven degrees of bacon. We're seeing it in real life here, you know? Well, don't freak her out. Yeah, OK, OK. Hi, Mrs. Putnam. My name is Bob Massey. I know that this is out of the blue and you don't know me from Adam. Well, she just about went crazy. Within seconds of speaking with Bob, I was in tears and laughing. He started telling me things that I knew, okay, he really has something because I've heard about this. It's astounding. It's, you just can't make this up. <laughs> the Joe Barris. <laughs> Here's the guy that says, oh, gee, how could I ever thank you? Oh, oh what an honor to finally meet you. The look of utter amazement, <laughs> stunned, and he started to cry. And as Bob pulled out pictures, my father started to name guys, like instantaneously, at 92 years old. Who's that guy? Who is that guy? <laughs> Good looking devil. <laughs> There's a fake in here somewhere. <laughs> he may not be able to, you know, 
remember what he had for breakfast, but he can remember back in 1941 how cold it was on Christmas Day. One of our troop ships was sunk by a submarine and approximately, give or take, 800 men died on Christmas Day. I always loved Christmas and I still do. I survived, but look at the, the ones that died. It was just phenomenal, the joy that it brought him. Dan, look up, Dan. Look Before and after. <laughs> it was like we were part of the family, and we got to celebrate with Grandpa, too. There was a bunch of stuff in your box, but there was one thing missing, so we brought somebody special for you. First of all, Joe, it's a pleasure to meet you. Talking to some of the guys here, um, I realize that you're missing one key piece and some of your souvenirs and your medals. That's a combat infantryman's badge, and it's only given to people that are actually in engagement with the enemy. So today I'd like to present you my, that I earned in, in Iraq, and I want to give it to you. When the National Guardsman, Rob, came from Joe's unit, he took it off and gave it to him, because it was missing from the box, even though it was on the picture. This is a greater honor for me to give this to you than you receiving this, I'm sure. Wonderful. It's unreal. Here you go, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you for your thank service. You. Oh. I appreciate that. Thank you. And he said, Bob, I never really did anything in my life. I'm not one of those big people. I came back, I got a job, took care of the family. I only wish I had deserved this. But... It's very deserving. Long time in coming. To be part of something that we really have no stake in other than his happiness.